welcome to the 10th episode of season 4 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 28th of June 2011 as we record and this episode in this episode we are going to talk about a neat neat HP microserver and hear an interview with Gemma Karen about Barcamp's Blackpool and Nottingham. We will of course go over the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, command line love and go over your feedback. I'm Mark and with me this week are Alan. Hello. Tony. Hello. And guest presenter Andy Piper. Hello. Hello, Andy Piper. Welcome back. Thank you very much. So, Alan, what have you been up to since the last show? Um, I free cycled this week. I got rid of a couple of um, things, batteries and printers, and the guy, one of the guys who turned up um, happened to be a new Ubuntu user. Wow. <laughs> Spooky. Yeah, right. huh? And also, I bought a game. Uh, well, actually, I didn't buy a game. I didn't pay anything for it because it's one of these... Um, Pay what you like games. Oh yeah, and it's you called paid nothing. Well, yeah, <laughs> the, the promo video. It's it's a really nice game. It's called Prown. P R O U N. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Prown, and it's a Windows game, but it runs under Wine absolutely perfectly on on Ubuntu. Okay. Um, and the promo video that I saw, um, it says it's a pay what you like game. You know, that's quite popular at the moment with like humble indie bundle and that yeah. kind yeah. of stuff. But it says you can pay what you like even nothing if you want to. And I thought, well, that's good because that lets me download it. And if I really like it, then I am going to give the guy some money. Right. But it lets me have a play with it first. And also lets me check to see whether it works on Linux. Ah. And so I downloaded it and ran the installer, install Wine, out of the box on 11.04. And it runs at full HD 1080p resolution on my screen. Cool. No slowdown, 100 frames a second. Brilliant. And it's a lovely, lovely game. I highly recommend it. Brilliant. Okay. Did you pay any money? I haven't yet. I only <laughs> bought it like yesterday or the day before. Oh, he okay. will. He yeah. will. Yeah, I will. He likes it that much. Yeah, I will. He's so, committed to it. Uh, the guy's server's down at the moment because he's, uh, the high score tables for the game, it's got like online high score tables, and he didn't realise just how popular it would be. And he said his web hosting was just some cheap and cheerful thing, and he got 1.2 million hits over, <laughs> over the weekend on ah. the high score table. Ooh. And they took it down and said they're not going to put it back up again. That'll so he's, he's having to find new hosting. Fair enough. Tony, how about you? Um, nothing very exciting it's weird having only done this a week since the last one Um, I haven't done very much (laughs) it's hard enough for you to think of something in two weeks isn't it (laughs) I know yeah when you live the dynamic lifestyle that I do Um, (laughs) but I did want to just mention the bar camp interview that we're going to play into the show a little bit later on Mm -hmm. um, that Les Pounder sent in so thank you Les for sending that interview in recording it and sending it to us Mm. Um, it's quite interesting because it talks about bar camp Blackpool and bar camp Nottingham that Gemma runs but it also reflects on odd camp I think which Mm. is a is a bar camp style event there are bar camp tracks um and the sort of things that go on at bar camps nottingham and blackpool the sort of things we like to see go on at odd camp as well so bear that in mind when you're listening i think mm, brilliant and i also wanted to remind people about the competition that we started in the last episode which is to win a copy of charles dickens the signalman and other ghostly tales in audiobook format by the people at textbook stuff we interviewed Bar- barnaby edwards um and we, there's a trailer which sounds like this I took you for someone else yesterday evening. That troubles me. That mistake? No. That's someone else. The monstrous thought came into my mind as I perused the fixed eyes and the saturnine face that this was a spirit, not a man. I said, below there, look out, look out. For God's sake, clear the way. In an old abbey town, down in this part of the country, a long, long while ago, there officiated as sexton and gravedigger in the churchyard one Gabriel Grubb. Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel, said the goblin. I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel. The story of the English bride, Basta. Well, not, not to call so slight a thing a story. Well, it's all one, but it's true. I find from what I have overheard that Mistress is haunted. How haunted? By a dream. What dream? By a dream of a face.
Perhaps I hide the truth from myself, but I do not think that when this began, I meditated to do him any wrong. I stole down after him, creeping under certain shrubs which grow in that place, and none but devils know with what terror I, a full-grown man, tracked the footsteps of that baby as he approached the water's brink. He had hardly spoken the words when a sound resembling a faint groan appeared to issue from the interior of the case. And one of the glass doors, slowly opening, disclosed a pale and emaciated figure in soiled and worn apparel standing erect in the press. Who are you? said the new tenant, turning very pale. Who are you? Charles Dickens, The Signalman and Other Ghostly Tales, read by John Sessions. Visit textbookstuff.com to find out more. So if you would like to win that, all you have to do is send in an email to competition at ubuntu-uk.org with the answer to this question. The question is, which novel did Dickens leave unfinished at his death? And you've got until Sunday the 17th of July to send us your entries. So good luck. And Andy, it's been a while since we've had you on the show. It is. It was dark the last time I was here outside <laughs> in the evening, and now it's light. Yeah, Gosh. Not, not for much longer at this rate. That's but, true. Yeah. <laughs> so what have you been up to uh, in the past week or so? So a um, couple of things. Um, I finally upgraded my, my main work machine to uh, 1104 uh-huh. um, and got over the little hurdles I, I, I was going to encounter. I knew I was going to encounter around the upgrade process. Anyway, um, and I met this lady in the corridor at work. Um, her name's Laura. I don't know if you, any of you know her. <laughs> nope. Um, we know and, a couple, actually. <laughs> uh, you know, actually. Yes, of course you do. Um, and she mentioned that her mum's upgraded to Natty and um, is, uh, was having some trouble getting... She couldn't get the Picasso icon to stay in the, uh, in the dock on the side. Oh, right. Oh, um, right. And the problem is that Wine Apps in Unity kind of launch as Wine.exe and they don't kind of oh, absorb. Yes. Yeah. So Docky and other dock solutions seem to have worked around this right and apparently the unity launcher hasn't sorted this out ah. fully yet um now it's made worse by the fact that picasso ships its own version of wine oh, yeah, it comes bundled yeah. as a wine so anyway wine, i, doesn't it, I yeah. thought well can't be that hard come on i'll have a go and anyway so i sent her a um a little dot desktop file with all the hacks i could manage to work out that would make, <laughs> kind of make it sort of kind of sort of ish work um, uh-huh. So I've been kind of pimping my my Unity and with all the additional um, lenses oh, and cool. launcher things you can do. I and mean, there's some mm-hmm. nice stuff in the wiki about what you can do. It's a bit manual at the moment, but I'm I'm a power user, right? So, oh. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, um, I'm I've got an uh, an Android tablet now. I've got a Motorola Zoom, so Ooh. I have been helping on the Zoom forums, although it's open to anyone who who uh, obviously has a, an Android tablet to kind of curate a nice list of honeycomb tablet optimized Android apps because. Mm. Um, the Google market outside of the US, you can't do a search. or It doesn't surface the tablet apps as a separate tab, which is oh, quite right. frustrating. Oh. So, um, yeah, we've been kind of curating this list, cool. which is slowly growing. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned the, um, the Unity thing, because I play Minecraft and I run it from the command line because I couldn't figure out how to make it stick in the launcher. So <laughs> yeah, you'll get the little wine. Um, Java thing. Yeah, you'll get the Ah, oh, right. Okay, Minecraft Java. <laughs> yeah, but you'll get on um, for wine apps, you'll get the like little wine, red wine glass yeah. icon appear, which doesn't which link I up like, with the, but... the launcher you've set up for it. So yeah. Oh, I'll have to look into that. Slightly annoying. And Mark, you skived off the last episode. I you did, I'm afraid. What was all that about? I was uh, up in Birmingham at a two day um, accessibility hack day. Um, so okay. I basically locked in a room with a bunch of geeks and users and various other people who were interested in accessibility and talked about problems and hopefully fixed some problems. Who would you upset to uh, make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> this was a sort of work related thing because oh, obviously cool. I do development, so I need to know how to make sure my developments are accessible to everybody who uh, who might come along and use them. Excellent. Sounds like a good time. Yeah, it was brilliant. Um, it was run by uh, a group called Dev CSI, who are all about um, promoting innovation among developers in the academic sector, and they run some really top-notch events. Cool. Okay, well, I think we should get on with the show. Yeah. <laughs> On 
on the last show, I mentioned that I'd bought an HP ProLine micro server, mm. and we had a few um, a few listeners email in and uh, send us messages on Twitter asking uh, if we could speak a bit more about it. And uh, I believe that Alan's uh, got at least one knocking about in his uh, in his domain. Um, so we thought we'd uh, we thought we'd do a bit of a a bit of a hardware review. Hmm. I haven't done one of those for a while. No. Yeah. Okay. So you two have both got. One of these things, Mark and Alan. Yes. yes. Andy and I do not have one, is that right? I do not. I was tempted when they first kind of started doing this very exciting deal and then they vanished off sale for a while because Alan, I think, bought most of the stock. <laughs> yes, then, I uh, bought them all. Most of the stock in yeah, the Western now world. They're available again. So, uh, mm. yes, tell us about them. They sound exciting. Well, it's, both, it's, it's um, I suppose, good to start by mentioning what this amazing deal is and probably why they became popular yeah, quite quickly it started in i think uh december or november last year and i i don't know where i saw him mentioned probably on twitter and it was 200 and something pounds not a huge amount of money for a server and then hp will give you a 100 pound cash back once you bought it and i thought that sounded like a good deal and that deal's yeah. been around since december and they said it would end at the end of december i think uh, right. and then it kind of disappeared and they went out of stock everywhere and then it came back and it's been back pretty much every month since then yeah so what's so good about these things? I mean, who wants a 4U rack server in their living room? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, basically... Oh, sorry. I'm just not my mic stand there. Basically, the um, the reason I wanted one is because I wanted something which would be relatively cheap for me to put um, a RAID array in so I've got somewhere reasonably safe to store all my stuff, which I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be lugging it around on my laptop all the time and I don't really have anywhere else to put it and last time i had an external hard drive it died on me and lost all my data so i figured i'd have somewhere uh, you know somewhere i can store it but i can still get at it mm. and, okay. uh, same, same for me i wanted a server at home that i could store stuff on and i've been u- used to using loads of usb drives and i was sick of having stuff spread all over usb drives and you had a drobo and things as well yeah i had a drobo but i was kind of unhappy with that so yeah i wanted something more flexible we won't go into why that yes, makes you unhappy again. I'm breaking out in sweats already. <laughs> <laughs> so I was being slightly facetious before because my understanding is it's not a 4U rack-mounted server. It is, in fact, a teeny tiny little shoebox size. Yeah, it looks like yeah. a looks small desktop PC, like a mini yeah. tower. How does it compare in size to the Drobo? Uh, if you put them side by side, it's, uh, I don't know, about... 20 25 percent bigger in every direction. Right, okay. Oh, right. Maybe a bit bigger. So, yeah, if it's four discs in and then, like, another optical drive on top and has the motherboard oh, slotted yeah. so underneath. it's a bit taller, yeah. So it's probably a bit bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. When you say discs, are these SAS discs? So yeah, SCSI? it's SATA. Four SATA. SATA discs, yeah. Yeah, so it comes, the one the one that we got um, ships with a gig of RAM, one SATA disc, which is 160 gig, and also has um, four uh, drive bays. But the one, the one disc you get is taking one of those drive yeah. bays. Oh, right. So you get three free. Yeah, but the optical bay is empty. So what I did was buy one of those drive mounting kits and I right. moved the 160 gig disc into the optical bay because it doesn't come with an optical drive. It's right. like got a blanking plate over it. So I put the 120 gig, 160 gig in there and then that gives you four bays in which to put big size discs. Mm. Cool. And then you can raid them up. Yes. Um, there it's got um, raid built into the motherboard or you can but do software raid. It's it's fake raid. Yeah, it's it's I, I tried I tried oh, using it and I thought I'd got I was really happy with myself that I got it all set up and I booted into Ubuntu and it just showed me it's one of those some ones discs. Where, I was like, oh it's one of those ones where you need the Microsoft Windows E bits to make the BIOS stuff work, right? Is Quite well, possible. Well it's on it's supported on Linux. Oh as well. it's supported on Linux. Oh, it's, okay. called, oh. it's called really confusingly the Linux software raid is called M D raid and this fake raid I think is called DM raid. Right. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It sends yeah. you messages on on Twitter, yes. yes. So, um, yeah. So I've chucked four two terabyte discs in mine, and so it's full um, of lots of discs. And it's also got USB ports and VGA ports on the back stuff. as well. Yeah, it's if got you want to expand well. it further. Yeah. And what CPU's got? Uh, has it got in it? It's a little AMD Athlon low power. It's, it's actually, I think, a laptop processor okay. yeah it so does there's, there's not a fan on the cpu no it's just passively cooled with the server fan pulling air through the whole case and it's it does dynamic scaling as well so that helps mm. conserve a bit of power as well so what speed is that running at not that you it matters so much i guess on a server <laughs> i think but... mine when it's idle is one gigahertz and it goes up to 2.2 maybe oh, right. but i think that might be a lie it might um, be, i think it might be nearer 1.6 yeah well according to my um Yobu little monitor thing most of the time mine's running um it's dual core i think 
um, or hyperthreading, I'm not sure, it's running at 0.8 uh, gigahertz and then goes up to 1.6, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. I may be thinking of another machine. Yeah, 0.8 <laughs> up to 1.6, and it is dual core, not right. hyperthreading. Right. One, okay. of, one, of, one of Alan's many servers in his server room <laughs> runs at a far faster speed. <laughs> yes. well, it sounds like with the not particularly stellar CPU and a not an overly generous amount of RAM. I mean, for the price, it's brilliant, but yeah. you know, it's not a huge amount of RAM. It's really all about the disks. It's all about essentially using it as a NAS device, a network-attached storage. Yeah, and if you were the kind of person that, that wanted to like chuck one disk in it and then you know, when you filled it up with photos or video, you know, you could put put um, Samba on there, for example. So, you know, it, it's obviously, it's a, it's a PC, so it'll run Ubuntu server. And then you could chuck all your extra stuff like a media server, like, I don't know, something like Media Tome or Twonky or, or whatever, or um, and then Samba to share your stuff out. Then as soon as you fill that up, chuck another disk in and another disk and, you know, away Presum- you go. Presumably if you're swapping disks out, you have to do migration of data and things. It's, it's manual rather it, than... It's not got any intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not like a Drobo where you can pull disks out and monkey them around. It, it is reliant on you to manually set up RAID. But um, that that's not so painful during the Ubuntu server install. It's it's you know it's possible to do that. Okay, and other stuff that's on board PCI slots or anything. Can you actually do anything with it other than disks? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, well, it comes with a gig of RAM. And yeah, there is, there's is it two slots. There's or? two slots. It can hold up to eight gig. Which, oh, okay. I, given the the processor, I'm sure that's uh, more than sufficient for anything you'd actually do with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then it's got two, I think it's got one PCI slot and one PCIe slot, is no, it? No, they're both PCIe. They're both PCIe, but, right. But one's like a times one and one's a times four or right. something. Right, and like they're that. both half height. So you can Yeah, use, they're very short. Yeah. Yeah. So what sort of things could you put those to? So I'm presuming it's already got a network socket on board. Yeah. yeah, it's got an Ethernet port. So I guess you could add, multi- if you wanted it to be your, your gateway device... Right. Okay. Or um, yeah, have multiple network ports on it. You could chuck a um, a little multi Ethernet device in there. Yeah. How about uh, something like another SATA card with external ports on it, so that you could connect? Yeah, that's discs? that's actually what I've done on mine oh, because right. one of the limitations. I, I genuinely didn't know that. That sounds really <laughs> fake and set up. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the problems with the onboard eSATA port is that it doesn't do port multiplying um, external arrays. Right. So, for example, if you buy an empty um, external uh, SATA enclosure yeah. that yeah. you put multiple disks in, it will only have one SATA cable that connects it to the yeah. host. And it will uh, the host will only see one drive. It mm. won't actually see all of the drives, so only one of them spins up, oh. which is a bit of a pain. Oh. But all of the cheap onboard eSATA ports are generally like that. Yeah. But my unit, I got an Edge 10 external drive array, ha- came with a PCI card. And the PCI card had a full height um, back uh, plate on it yeah and i looked in the box and actually there was also a half height back plate oh nice. there's only a half height card so yeah. i unscrewed the back plate screwed on the half height one put it inside and now i've got two extra port multiplying ports so i could chuck another four discs and another four discs in it and i'm laughing okay so what are you two using yours for mark you gave us a little bit of an overview but is there anything other than just file storage um i'm also using mine as a web server for um I'm basically trying to um, see what cloud services that I use that I can run myself. So, you know, we've uh, been interviewing like the guys from Own Cloud and course, yeah. Synchrony in the past couple of shows. I decided to sort of uh, try and dog food it, see what I could actually do uh, myself. I've done, I've put Own Cloud on it um, and it works. Okay. And I've I've um, been playing around seeing if I can replace Google Docs with something. Um, at the moment, uh, the best I've done is uh, Drupal with a load of plugins. Um, which I've actually managed to do a surprising amount with. I've got it doing something I can take notes on, some spreadsheets and presentations. Um, And I've got uh, Roundcube webmail running on it because I was fed up with desktop email clients that always crash on me. Uh, (laughs) Have you tried Evolution? (laughs) I was joking. Oh, my God. Um, And, yeah, at the moment I'm looking for something that would – some sort of photo management thing that I can upload to from my phone. But – Part of the problem with that is the fact that I've only got a self-signed SSL certificate on it and right. Android applications don't often cope with that as well as they might. But yeah, basically, I'm using it to run web applications and for backups and stuff. Has it got enough RAM for that? It doesn't struggle? Yeah. Or? No, no, not really. Um, the, the the only time I've really noticed it struggling so far, um, other than loading some of the more complicated pages on Drupal, um, is um, doing like things like 
um, apt updates and things like that. Right. Well, so, I mean, yeah, if they're intensive ones. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, you, you don't really need, I mean, I used to run a home server with, I think, 768 or whatever the re- relevant multiplier of, of RAM was, right? So you, unless you're really heavily pushing the thing with lots of connections on Apache, you're not going to really run out of RAM on, on, on that and kind especially of... Especially if you're one user. Exactly, yeah. that's the point, yeah. yeah. So, so for, for, for an individual user, that's going to be perfectly yeah. adequate. Um, so you, did, you, you say you use it for media storage and stuff as well? Uh, or... Well, it's not... I don't I don't stream off it or anything right. at the moment. I've, I just use it to put stuff on and um, access it over, like, network shares. Right, because one of my use cases, I guess, for having that kind of storage at home is things like... Um streaming to my Revo for the for the media stuff mm. and then having a load of content for iTunes, yes, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> on there as well. And that's a nightmare, actually, because just because the file structures are such a pain for iTunes and trying to make that work happily with everything else. Mm. I, do, I do have media on mine, but it's mostly actually stuff that I just download from BBC iPlayer, um, and I just have it sitting in a directory and it's shared out via Samba yeah. and pretty much everything can get to that. And yeah, I that's can, what I've I done just before. just open files up and I just open them up in whatever media player happens to be on whichever machine is there at the time and uh, that seems to work all right. Yeah, I've, I've done it before um, just having fi- just video files on a Samba share hooked up to laptops, my Wii, things like that and it just sort of works. What I also use mine for is um, remote backups. So it, I use a tool called R Snapshot to go off and get um, a backup of a bunch of remote machines, including my VPS at Bitfolk, and also all of lug.org.uk <laughs> is backed up onto it. And I do that every four hours and do a like hourly, daily, mm. monthly, you know, thing that our snapshot does. And it, it's okay. Uh, the only, the only problem with it is it, because of the vast amount of IO required to do our snapshot when it's doing diffs of a whole file system, that has got a bazillion little files like, yeah a mailman mailing list is going to have that's been there for five years. Yeah. It, it chugs a bit because there's a lot of IO and I've tried to tune it. And as I mentioned last time, I've asked a bit on the internet and tried to get it as best as I possibly can. and had some good tips, but I think I'm reaching the boundaries of what's possible with those SATA discs. I don't, I don't think the box is necessarily Mm. being pushed. I think it's IO. So Mm. you're both running Ubuntu on it, I assume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, was that installed you said it hadn't got the optical drive, so it was by blank. USB or uh, yeah, it was blank when I got it. Yeah, same thing. And I used a USB key. Cool. Yeah. But the only gotcha, actually, <laughs> worth noting is, is it doesn't work. Is I put a Ubuntu server on a USB key, plugged it in, and did the install, and at the end, it um, it put Grub on the USB key and not on the hard <laughs> oh, drive. Clever. Oh. Because by default, it went to SDA, and SDA at the time of boot was the oh. USB oh, right. key. Which was a bit duff. But you were able to fix that? Yeah, Grub, you know, right. reinstall Grub. And so that's right disc. USB 2 slots on, the, on it, I assume, because I can't... Yes. I'm not on this, I mean, obviously it's not related to this machine specifically, but I have had some interesting challenges getting USB 3 to boot and install than 2. Oh, right. Yeah. No, they're, they're USB 2 on the front. I think they're USB 1 on the back. Right. But the back ones are the ones I think you have to use for the keyboard. If and, you plug a USB yeah, keyboard because there's no... Um, PS2 ports. You have yes. to have a USB keyboard, as I found out, not owning a USB keyboard. Oh, yeah. That's why you asked to borrow a USB yes. keyboard. Um, the, the other gotcha I found was um, creating a um, creating the USB disk uh, on the... I think I was creating it on um, the latest uh, release. I forgot right. what it's called. Natty. Creating it on Natty, but with um, a Lucid Image for some reason... Uh, when it tried to boot, it got to the um, the prompt and then failed. So I then just had to type in install or Linux install or whatever. Right. Get Did it you working. use UNet booting or um, you, um, or the USB startup disk creator thing that comes? I think with them. the USB startup disk creator. Yeah, thing. I've had I've had problems with that. I found I find UNet booting is a lot more reliable. Right, it's very nice because you get to choose which distro as well. Or yeah, exactly mm, what you want to download. Yeah, it just goes, yeah, give me the latest or, or you know latest. Uh, live version or whatever so yeah it's great it's well, worth it's- also mentioning that it does actually have a 3d capable vga card in it oh wow it's got so, an AT- ati card so it can actually run no, a, compo- a composited that. desktop you could actually <laughs> use it as a desktop pc you could use it for unity awesome oh, yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah well it sounds like this is you know the 2011 version of the Viglan MPCL that Absolutely. we gave away back in season one. Yes. So if you listen in in the next episode, we've got one of these lovely things to give away. Thanks mm, to Alan. All shiny, in its box, untouched by human hand. Absolutely. So <laughs> Just as well. In, tune in, <laughs> or, or mine. 
tune into episode <laughs> 11 and find out how you can win. It's time for the news, and Veronics are reporting a possible culprit and potential fix for the power problems in the recent Linux kernels. Since 2.6.38, which shipped with Ubuntu 11.04, it's been widely known that battery performance has been noticeably worse than previous releases. Veronix is reporting a patch by Matt Garrett as a possible cause. Oh dear. The angry Matt Garrett. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, it, look, and it looks like the workaround is just a simple boot flag in your grub. Oh, right. And everyone wins. Uh, better battery performance, but we'll have to wait and see when there's more testing. They've, Phoronix and some other guys have done some testing already. The uh, article's quite interesting. It talks a lot about their setup for monitoring power usage and finding which mm. patch might have caused the problem and stuff. So yeah. worth a read for that alone. Yeah. Apple is showing its trademark defending muscle by sending a cease and desist notice to Amahi, the home server project, over its use of the term App Store. Amahi have responded by running a Name the Store contest. Yeah, this is because they're trying to defend their patents because somebody else is suing them or they're suing no, they're, somebody else. Yeah, they're suing Amazon and Amazon. they need to prove that they are generally defending it to mm. show that it's a valid trademark oh, or something. Oh, because Amazon have an Android app, app store. store. Yes. And I think Amazon, I think the, the last I heard, and this is I'm not, a, not a lawyer, but the last I heard <laughs> I think was that the judge was kind of indicating to um, Apple that they may be about not to get... Yeah. things decided in their favour unless they could really prove that they were defending it more. Wow. You know, or they, you know they really owned it. Oh, that'd be good. Because yeah. the, the the term does seem it's fairly generic. Pretty generic. I mean, genericised, you know. I don't even like the term. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> well, it's like podcast, isn't it? It's <laughs> kind of stuck. Oh, yes. One fun thing on the Amahi website is now their link that used to say App Store now just randomly goes through user-submitted names oh, every cool. time you load the page. <laughs> that's kind of fun. <laughs> and dangerous. Firefox's new rapid release cycle has been criticised for making life difficult for those wishing to deploy Firefox in businesses. Asa Dotzler of Mozilla has responded to comments by saying that enterprise support isn't Mozilla's primary concern. Yeah, upsetting quite a lot of corporate people. Yeah. Mm. It's all to do with their new release cycle where they release every six months and it's a whole six new... Weeks. Six, six weeks. Six weeks, sorry. And it's a whole new version and they stop supporting the old version. Yeah, so yeah. Well, that's five just came out and they stopped supporting four. That's the that critical right? part. They're no longer going to issue security patches on 4. 4 yeah, is right. essentially immediately end of life and it's automatically wow. upgraded for everyone. So if you're working for a big business that's rolled it out to several hundred thousand employees, then um, you might care about security fixes on something. But you say automatically rolled out. Surely that's at the decision of the administrators of the network. Uh, it's actually the decision of the user, isn't it? Because you get the pop-up saying, there's a new version of Firefox. Do Assuming you you're allowed to. Sorry. Yeah, but you, you're allowed it could to install be, your own. It um, could be locked down I'm pretty sure okay. you could stop maybe that's the case that. with Firefox yeah. but even then would you want to run an and, old and of course unsupported if, release if you're running Chrome it's just going to do all that for you anyway yeah, under yeah. the covers but then how many enterprises are using Chrome so that's another discussion well <laughs> uh, it, I don't think it, it it is fairly straightforward my, my daughter uses Chrome on um, a Mac which is um, par parental controlled and that doesn't auto update oh really? oh really yeah because it can't get to the website that has the Google updates on it ah, okay. because the parental controls don't let her. So it's pretty trivial. All you've got to do is set all your enterprise to be controlled like a seven-year-old girl <laughs> and you're sorted. And, and then, of course, you get no security updates. So as soon as a, a vulnerability is discovered, your entire enterprise is, is vulnerable. Well, you just leave it everyone to visiting CBBS. <laughs> oh, I see. Sorry. Yes, there, there's there's <laughs> ways around uh, all right, of this. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, the security expert. Two-fifths of Oswatch, the open source software advice service based at the University of Oxford Computing Services, have left form open directive the new company will work to promote open innovation helping new developments in the academic research center find commercial partners to bring their ideas to market Ooh. now this is interesting and janet and jisk are one of those organizations that's been quite heavily hit by some of the funding cuts. yes so is this them trying to make a bit of a commercial go of one of their operations essentially yeah the funding for oswatch has been declining as i understand it and the um so two of the guys are basically saying well we can provide some of the services funding with funding from the private sector yeah, fair enough so could be good i mean what what other projects other than the only one i know that's come from academia is zen um like large open source mm, projects the internet and well, okay, yeah. <laughs> dasher yeah i kind of meant the uk yeah um well tim berners lee 
All right. Um, it's conservative. Is he an open source project? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where's the source code? You can patch him. Conservative Party advisor Liam Maxwell, author of a 2009 report promoting the use of open source in government, has been appointed appointed to advise the coalition on the use of ICT. Which could, could be good news. Could yeah. be good news. Let's hope so. Could not, you know. I've not seen any of his work, so I, I, I will wait until I have seen it. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully he will continue to support uh, open source in, in his new role. And now a couple of events. Uh, the UK Loco team are having what they affectionately call a Books and Butties Day. And for those who don't know, a butty is a sandwich. Uh, <laughs> on the 24th of July from 10am till 3pm, starting at the British Library in London and moving on to Somewhere Green for a geek picnic. A geek nick. The British Library is very nice. I'm not sure whether there's, there's a, green spaces there. But. Uh, yeah, not necessarily in there, but maybe move, you know, a short way, Hyde Park, oh, okay. Tube and Ride or something. Specifically, there's a sci-fi exhibition at the British yes. Libraries. So. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what's interested a few people. Go along and see the exhibition and then go and have a picnic in a field and have a bit of fun. Well, that sounds like fun. Mm. Um, and there'll be a link in the show notes where people can find out more. Yes. And of course, the event you uh, you all want to hear about, Og Camp, is of course happening uh, at the Farnham Meltings in Surrey on the 13th and 14th of August. Yay! Very soon. Yes. It's Scarily easy. soon. At the point we release this, it'll be just five weeks to go, and that's Ooh. just two episodes of this show left before the actual oh, thing. Man. There's a remarkable amount of hair on display still yeah. for, for the people, you know. I have mine cut, so you can't people. see the grey hair. That's <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have each one cut out in turn. Um, we need to thank Bitemark for sponsoring the event. They are our primary sponsor, and they've coughed up the most money to get us there, and without them it really wouldn't be happening. So mm. thank you very much indeed, Bitemark. Um, but we've also had sponsorship from Chris Proctor on behalf of Log.org.uk, so thank you, Chris. And uh, the Evening Do, which is happening on the... Saturday, yeah, yes, got that right. Uh, is being sponsored by Vit Bit Folk, Vit Folk, Bit Folk. They're Russian equivalent, yes. Um, and some people who want to save uh, on hotel costs have decided to og camp quite literally. Yeah, they're going to be camping somewhere in a field near Surrey. Uh, so if you're interested in doing that, if you contact ogcamping at gmail dot com, you can find out more details. There are still a few tickets left, just under 30 at the moment, mm. so you've got time till to book a ticket if you haven't already done so, and come along to what's going to be a fantastic sort of weekend of people bringing along talks, some scheduled speakers and some kind of just random impromptu talks. If you want to meet up with like-minded people and hear some cool stuff, then come along. It really Absolutely. is worth it. Our guest presenters allowed on the traditional episode of the podcast that you record at Og Camp. Uh, oh, I can see they're depends considering if this. Depends being any sort of, you know, anybody gets run over by a bus. Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, filled in the forms. That yeah, that's be, true. Uh, oh, there's so much paperwork to do. But yeah, <laughs> hopefully you'll all come along. Andy, you're coming along as well, aren't you? I certainly am, yes. Yeah. It's going to be my first dog camp. I'm very excited. Excellent. Excellent. That's what we'd like to hear. And we're all going to be there. So we'll see you there. So it's time for Command Line Love, and this particular command is something that I noticed after the last episode, um, because it was around uh, password expiry time in the company I work for. Um, So let me just explain. Um, So if you're a user in in a big business company like me, um, where we've got expiry policies, or if you just like to have your own kind of uh, set up your password expiry so that you're regularly changing it to be nice Uh and secure... Of course, we sh- we all do. Right? We're yeah, yeah. always changing our passwords. Um, then, so you may have set up password expiry. Now, the only problem I find with that is that if I when I log in within a sort of the, the five five day window before it expires, it, it it does tell you in the login window on Ubuntu on Ubuntu, but does you will really? never notice. Oh. You very oh. it literally just flashes up as you log into the desktop, so it kind of <laughs> vanishes before you even have a, a, a chance to realise. Oh. <laughs> and sometimes you do notice, but you just didn't, can't read the number. So I thought, well, hold on a minute. It must be possible to find out when my password expires. And there is a really simple command. It's just a Unix command. So if you go to the command line and type expiry minus C, it will tell you the number of days until your password expires. I just did oh, that cool. and it didn't do anything. Uh, uh, have you, you got password have... expiry set up for your account? No. You see, no. <laughs> if I type expiry minus C right now on your corporate laptop... <laughs> It doesn't say anything. That's a problem. Maybe it only says, oh, no, that's a good one. Now maybe it, oh, fail. <laughs> maybe it only tells you if you're within the expiry window. The, yeah. The, oh. Ah. 
they oh, said right. together. Or I'm just yeah. completely wrong. Like, of course. Or maybe when it's only when it's got the network connection up to check against whatever LDAP service. Uh, yeah, but mine isn't use. doing that. Mine is a local password file. Yeah. So, it, so, so I just um, pulled up the man page for expiry. It's a very simple command. Yes, it, it is. has two it is. options. And it says the expiry command one checks make it work. the current <laughs> password expiry time and forces changes when required. That's it. That's boom. Well, simple. I can assure you cool. that when I had that problem uh, about two weeks ago, just after the last episode was recorded, I or maybe it was even last week, I typed expiry minus C and it said three days or whatever it was. Oh, that's cool. So, Is there a bug file about the fact that it doesn't show on their login screen? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. We should file that. A friend of the show, Andy Stanford Clark, and I have discussed this problem before mm. because we have this, we obviously have the same corporate setup. So, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. Mm. It's quite annoying. Oh, cool. Okay. Like it. Both fire bugs then. Mm. And that's the end of the command line love. Okay, this afternoon I'm here with Gemma Cameron, who's uh, the queen of the bar camp, I do believe. Gemma, (laughs) can you tell me a bit more about what is it you do? Um, well, I, I wouldn't say I'm the queen of bar camps. I've, uh, I've, I'm maybe the queen of bar camp Blackpool. Um, I've organised two bar camp Blackpools, and um, I'm organising another one this year. And um, bar camp Nottingham would be the first from the East Midlands. Um, got started with it all probably about 2006, 2007. Uh, started going to Geek Up. Geek Ups are a meet up or a <laughs> for geeks. Um, <laughs> And I started finding out about bar camps. I went to my first one in Manchester. Um, I cannot remember when that was, but it was the very first Manchester one. Mm-hmm. And it just blew my mind. It was amazing to go along to this place for free. We went all went on a Saturday, turned up to this massive room full of geeks, full of other developers, yeah. and everyone just learning and knowledge sharing and learning learning stuff, not from people who are paid to speak, but people who actually do this day to day it's just absolutely fascinating um and then there was a few pizzas brought in for the after party and um more drinking which was very very fun but you've got an eclectic mix of people haven't you it isn't just typical um uh, one group of developers such as web developers you have got quite a mix of people there haven't you? you've got Let's see, web developers that I know, software developers, you've got mobile application developers. You haven't just got developers, though. You've also got designers. You've got um, photographers. You've got people who are just sort of self-confessed geeks, people who, who aren't interested in geekery at all. Anything that you've, mm-hmm. you've got something to talk about that you're quite passionate about. If The best talks are usually the ones that aren't actually technical as well. We've, I, I do talks about my ferrets and, and roller derby. Um, we've got... Um, Lally, who comes along to Blackpool, and she, she gives an introduction to the British Sign Language. The sessions, again, they can be on absolutely anything. It all depends on who turns up on the day. And the more eclectic a mix of people you get, the more information, the more expertise, and the more fun stuff that you, you get. Um, the sessions also aren't just, aren't just talks. They can be discussions. They can be um, somebody trying to get some ideas and opinions on a new concept they've come up with or trying to find out more information or doing a workshop. Absolutely anything. Yeah. What would you think is the appeal of the, a bar camp to people? Is it just the, the mix of people or is it something else? Uh, generally, it's the free booze. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... Good answer. <laughs> I think um, with it being free... And it, it being different to a normal conference, like I say, where where you have to pay a lot of money and the people who come along are seen as experts in their field and they're paid to go around the world and speak. This is a bit more grassroots. Getting, getting to meet these people who, who do this day to day and they've been learning and teaching themselves and learning from other people. Getting to choose, because there's always at least three talks going on at once, so you get to see which one to go to. A lot of the time you're torn. Um, the Sheffield one, my last bar camp I went to, I was I was torn in three. I wanted to go to all of them. Bar camp sessions are quite short as well. Um, but usually the speaker's on for about 20 minutes, more like a lightning talk style whereas a conference they might be talking for uh, at least an hour. All attendees are generally expected to bring a talk with them. If that puts people off, we always say you don't have to bring one, but try, try and bring one with you because you'll always end up changing your mind once you've seen your first talk. It's a lovely place yeah. to 
to try out public speaking. Everyone's so friendly and welcoming. They help you get the information out and they ask you the questions. It's nothing, no one's trying to shoot you down. Everyone's trying to help and everyone wants to learn. It's just a really nice place to be, a really nice atmosphere. So Bar Camp Nottingham is going to be on the 23rd and 24th of July, which isn't far away now, no, is it? it's very exciting. Um, yeah. I'm going to be away for um, a couple of weeks, so when I get back next month, it's going to be all go organising that. Um, we're, we're pretty much done. We, we've got the venue sorted out, which is going to be at the Nottingham Hack Space. Um, I'm really looking forward to having it there. But it's it's a huge, beautiful old building um, behind the uh, at the ice arena. And we've got a massive space. We've got, we can split it all up into different rooms. The benefit of it being a community space is that we can be there as long as we want. So we, we're going to have it as a whole, a 30 hour bar camp Wow. <laughs> so um, it's it, it's uh, an oh, it's it's an all nighter rather than being an overnighter because um, there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through if you're wanting to make somewhere safe for people to sleep overnight. Forget about yeah. sleeping, just turn up, <laughs> bring your Red Bull, yeah. crack on, work on through. <laughs> um, really, really excited. It's going to be East Midlands' first bar camp, um, like like Blackpool was Lancashire's first bar camp. I'm expecting us to get a huge amount of people there's there's already so much going on in nottingham it's a really vibrant city with lots of yeah. uh, of tech groups i mean i i run sorry i run geek up i help run the nottingham girl geek dinners with kate we also have a nottingham digital community which gets all the other organizers along so there's there's not tuesday second wednesday and uh, there's a tuttle there's oh the cocoa heads uh, there's a developers meetup there's a lot going on and a lot of people it'd be great to get all these different groups together so not all of them are developers there's, there's people there who are technical entrepreneurs or you know just just label themselves as being a bit geeky or have a real interest in, in certain areas yeah. so i think there's gonna yeah. be a great great mix and it'll be new people that haven't been to bar camps before you obviously get the uh, the usual suspects coming along <laughs> they go to every single bar camp um, and we've got quite a few people signed up from around the country coming along uh, all, all the people that um, that go to the hack space that are hack space members they're all going to be there as well so i think it's going to yeah. be it's going to be interesting getting them all in a room with some booze and <sighs> yes i wish i was there <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know that uh, where you're at, the hack space, recently that's just moved location, hasn't it? It used to be near the train yes, station. Yes, it did. They, uh, they had a few problems. The uh, the people that were renting it off um, had to close the whole building down. Um, it was it was really conveniently located, but they've now yeah. got, thank, thanks so much to all the people who donated, but thanks to those people, they were able to get up a deposit to move into much bigger and better premises. It's still in just in Nottingham city centre. It's... Um, just a bit further from the train station so it's behind the uh, ice arena but again you've got beautiful big old mills around that area because it was all the sort of lace market and you know, so during the industrial revolution you've got these beautiful big buildings that are now empty and they've got a fantastic space to to allow us to do things like bar camps and they obviously have their open days and do all their hacking there so it's going to be on the 23rd and 24th of July. What time do the doors open on the 23rd? Um, I think the doors are opening at 10 o'clock. We decided if we do a little bit of a later start, people will appreciate that. Um, and with it being all through the night, we're going to keep the talks going on until a bit later as well. Um, some bar camps open the door at 9 and we stop the talks at 5. We're going to try and uh, delay it a little bit. Um, have lunch as well. Hopefully, if we've got sponsors, lunch will be provided. Uh, dinner, breakfast think drinks, uh, food through the night, things like that will hopefully all be provided. If not, um, we are in the city centre. There's lots of shops around. Uh, we can get takeaway ordered in for people. And so we've, we've kind of got a nice free reign. We really, really appreciate Hackspace allowing us to use that their space. <laughs> and you can go to uh, bcnot.org.uk, sorry, .co.uk. So bcnot.co.uk. Uh, you can get your tickets, they're all readily available. We're still looking for sponsorship if anyone wants to get in touch with me. I'm at Ruby underscore Gem, or it's Gemma with a G, Gemma.cameron at gmail.com. Right, well, on to your second bar camp, which is the one that I've been to on two occasions now, which is Bar Camp Blackpool. Yeah. In the, the town that has many donkeys and many pies. 
a massive tower. I, I love Barcamp Blackpool. There's um, the, the people who come along. We do have a we have regulars, the, the people from uh, Geek Up Preston who are involved around there. But a lot of people have a, a big love for Blackpool. They say you, you turn up on the Friday, you check into your B and B, um, turn up for Barcamp Blackpool, which is in a beautiful, beautiful venue. It's uh, it's we, we do have to raise quite a lot of sponsorship because it's um, it's in this casino at the Pleasure Beach. They take really good care of us. We're in the Paradise Room. So you, you come to go into the Pleasure Beach itself and you go into the ticket office where you'd normally buy tickets and go up, you, you arrive at this beautiful Art Deco hotel sort of space, go up these stairs, walk through these doors and you're there in the Paradise Room which has got a beautiful big stage, got blue light, blue fairy lights all over the ceiling. Um, they've got partitions, so we, we break the room into three, so we have a big space in the middle. There's booths at the back for people to sit in. Uh, there's Wi-Fi. We have the lovely Alistair who uh, who always sorts out the Wi-Fi and a, a view over over the Pleasure Beach, over Blackpool. Uh, at lunchtime, we are going to definitely have the pies bag. We had everybody go outside and queue up for these pies, from hot pies from a van last time. Everyone, everyone, I think the Southerners were a little bit confused by these pies but uh, everyone else seems to really enjoy them uh, and i know my mate turned up just in time to get his pie voucher oh did he got he got it came straight downstairs he come all the way from liverpool and he's probably going to listen to this it's dan lynch from linux outlaws <laughs> podcast he literally turned up went hiya oh pie voucher went outside for his pie straight away <laughs> he's a proper yeah. northerner <laughs> i always see you say <laughs> Um, yes, we, we have a, a nice big board at the back as well. So we split the room into three last time. We ended up um, having to make more areas, didn't we? Because we had many people yeah. wanting to talk. So we'll, uh, we're going to modify it a bit this year, probably have shorter sessions and have more of them. And uh, we always have a nice after party because we've got this beautiful space. It's got this big stage and they've got lighting and PA system and stuff. We, we had a magician the last couple of years, so we might mix it up this year and see if we can get some more entertainment in. Either that or people are going to uh, just just do the usual PowerPoint karaoke, maybe bring some um, consoles, put them up in a big projector, and uh, yeah. definitely, definitely werewolf. Bar Camp Blackpool, it's grown over the years, hasn't it, really? Not the actual event itself, it's events in the same place, but your attendees it has gone from... I think the first one was about, was it 40-something or maybe 50-something? Yeah, we, we had about 50 people. We had about 90 people sign up the first year and about 50 on the day. Uh, last year we had 150 tickets allocated and we had 120 people turn up. That's a lot of pies. Yeah, it was, I, I was stunned. Um, it was so good to be able to provide something for all these people and have them all turn up. And the tickets get snapped up. We sold out of tickets. I had a waiting list. <laughs> I think it's going to be exactly the same this year. The the word has definitely spread that Blackpool, Barcamp Blackpool is something special. And I, I put it down to the Pleasure Beach. Um, yeah. Blackpool, Blackpool itself is a very special place. Right, so Barcamp Blackpool is going to be on Saturday the 15th of October, it is that right? Yeah, tickets are not on sale yet, but um, keep your eyes peeled. Follow uh, BC Blackpool on Twitter. Keep an eye on the website, barcampblackpool.com, and uh, we'll let you know. I think it'll be just after Nottingham, so I can start gearing up. And again, we're still looking for sponsorship for Bar Camp Blackpool. It's really important that we get sponsorship for that because we have to pay for the venue um, and for food. Yeah. yeah. Gemma, so sponsorship for the events. So who do you want to be your sponsors? Um, we've we've had sponsors in the past, such as PayPal and Yahoo, uh, Microsoft. But we've had um, we've had quite a few people who are who have local businesses who are very interested in sponsoring as well. And I'd love to get more local businesses involved just so that, that they can really keep in touch and really get, get to know the people in the community. So the local community and the tech community, the, these are the people that they need to be reaching out and talking to. Uh, this, the sponsorship money, as say, goes towards things like the venue and food and things like that. In turn, you get put in front of all these people um, so if, if you're wanting to reach out to developers and to designers and technical people, and that this is you know, a really great thing, great way of you to do that very cheaply. Um, we also advertise it a lot online. There's, there's a, actually a ma not just the people who turn up on the day, there's a, there's a whole build up to it online. A lot of people who can't perhaps make it, they all take an interest and follow the tweets, um, look at all the blog posts afterwards. So, yeah, in return for your sponsorship, depending on the level, 
we'll tweet about yeah. you we'll tweet to thank you we'll put some you know put your logo on the website we'll um talk about you in the opening and closing speeches at bar camp um we can even if we get sponsorship money for t-shirts we'll put your logo on the back of the t-shirts things like that for the events um do you need anything else apart from sponsorship? Do you need any uh, equipment or um, people to help out or any um, freebies? The main thing that people like from a bar camp is swag. So if your company hasn't got um, you know cash to maybe give or want to get their name out to all the attendees, give us some merchandise, give us cups, give us pens, stickers, absolutely anything. We'd really like some swag. <laughs> Right, well, I'll just do a quick recap then. So uh, we've got Bar Camp Nottingham, which is 23rd and 24th of July in Nottingham's Hack Space. And we've got Bar Camp Blackpool, which is Saturday the 15th of October at Blackpool um, It'd Week. be lovely, really lovely to get some new faces there and hopefully some of, uh, some of the listeners will pop along or at least follow it online. That's all the questions. Thanks yeah, very much. Thanks, Les. <laughs> It's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Gerald. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I was disappointed that Andy didn't come yeah. in with that as well. It's got to be on top. <sighs> I was the one that reminded you before. You were, yes. Yeah, I was looking for that yeah. validation there. Sorry. Uh, oh. And the ecosphere. So Ubuntu developers apparently have um, removed the Synaptic Package Manager from the 11.10 default install. The sky is falling. Outrageous. This is the end of Ubuntu. This is the worst thing that happens since they moved the buttons from one side to the other. Yes, <laughs> and they removed the Did game. they move buttons? When, no, what? Yeah, you don't yeah. remember that? Oh, dear. Um, yeah, so this is the end of Synaptic, thanks to the Ubuntu Software Center. Oh, well. Well, hmm, okay. <laughs> I can see why some people want to keep it, but personally, I have pretty much never used it other than when someone says, how do you do this in Synaptic? And I open it and then look at it and think, now I know why I don't use this. <laughs> you know, I was going to say, hold on a minute, didn't they remove this? the last release but actually oh, that was aptitude and i'm getting exactly. myself confused and i kind of weaned myself off of using the aptitude commands to apt get because i'm pretty much a command line person anyway mm -hmm. um yeah i do i have used synaptic occasionally i always struggled with it whereas i have never struggled with the software center no mm. it's not yeah it's not it's not the most usable tool in my opinion mm. but it's, it's featureful nice, yes, you know correct. and there's there is a feature that it has that I have never used, but I've all, I keep seeing people ask questions about and recommend that to them. And that is if you've got two computers and one's online and one's offline and you want to get updates on the offline one or you want to install software on the offline one, you can go into Synaptic, mark things as I want to install this, and then there's an option under the first menu which will generate a script that you run on the machine oh, that, you, yeah. that is online and then you double get the files mm. and bring them across. Which is quite handy, but I don't know. Didn't you criticise the way that you could do the uh, depackage or aptitude thing before? When, when, on the last oh, no, this episode. is slightly different. This oh, is, this is cooler, isn't it? Yeah, better it works. This, this is okay. Don't yeah. get the craft. Yeah. This, is, this is not rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> cool. What's up next, Andy? Nice try. Steel Storm, brackets, game, <laughs> is now available for $2.99 in the Ubuntu Software Centre. Yeah, I put the game in there because I know none of you play games. So I, I play just wanted games. to make Excuse that me. clear. Excuse me. <laughs> Just because I don't buy a Windows license so I can do so doesn't now, mean I don't play games. Ooh, now, the, the, yeah. we, should, we should just clarify that this is a, a sale price until July the uh, 5th, after which the game rises in price to $10. Wow. wow. I think that's, that, that's good. I mean, yeah. you look at the success of things like the Android Marketplace and the Apple App Store uh, in terms of 59p, £2 games. They're insanely successful, yeah. the good ones. Um, and there's loads of them. There's a proliferation of them. And if we can get more of that kind of, mm. you know, market, then you get people just clicking and, and that money goes to Canonical and helps support the development of Ubuntu and goes to the developers who make the game and makes them realise that Linux is a viable platform for gaming. And this was always coming, wasn't it, when we were talking to MPT in your kitchen one time, Alan, for an episode. <laughs> uh, I think you mean Studio B. Yeah, sorry, that's what I meant, yeah, with its own dishwasher. Yes. Um, it was obviously clear at that point that they were looking to make this available in future. Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, it's always been, you know, it's not called a, um, 
you know, a software center. You wouldn't, you know... It's, it was called Software Store originally. It was originally, but, you know, it's pretty obvious. So, Alan, as a seasoned gamer, perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about the features and, and, and the type of game that we're talking about. Is this, is this a Tetris-style puzzle game? Well, we don't have time to give you a full review, uh, <laughs> and also I've not played it, uh, but I have seen a YouTube video of it in as action, I. <laughs> which I think is enough. It looks quite fun, I have to it say. It does. It's like one of these frenetic shooty games yeah. where you're overhead view and you just, like, have Shoot bombs, absolutely right? everything Excellent. until it blows up. Yeah, absolutely. it's one of those... Get rid of your aggression type Suitable games. for children. Marvellous. Glad to hear it. Yes. Is it a picture of a spaceship on the box? Or uh, the I'm not sure you box. get a box through yeah. the software centre. I'm not I sure really if there's a to this, have I? app get box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe I don't understand these things. Okay. Uh, what's up next, Mark? Uh, the Ubuntu UK local community team, along with many other teams, are planning to go before the Loco Council to, for reapproval sometime before the Oneric release. <laughs> Oneric release, yes. Now, this is, this is a regular thing, isn't it, for Loco teams? Yeah, it started um, about a year ago. The Loco Council, which I'm on, um, were asked to uh, reapprove Loco teams. So there's a process by which we can approve Loco teams and say, hey, look, we recognise you do fantastic advocacy work mm. um, and we recognise that... The, what you're doing is valuable to the community and valuable to Ubuntu as a project. So we'll mark you as an approved team. And therefore there are some benefits that you get as, as being an approved team, not okay. least, you know, recognition that, you know, your peers have noted that it is a, a good set of work you're doing, but you also get some free stuff from canonical, um, like Ooh. CDs and stuff. Right. Um, and recently they decided that actually what had happened is loads of teams have been, approved but then they just carried on being approved whether that status was still approved whether they right. carried on doing stuff or not right so we decided to um go through a reapproval process to make sure that everyone's still keeping up you know the good work so if a team is really keen and then drops off at some point they'll become unapproved yes and and we, we they're approved when you get approved you're approved for two years right and so when it comes around to reapproval time we'll look back over the last two years see what's been done and you need to document that you know you need to mm -hmm. create a wiki page which is a reapproval page which lists all the things you've done and also the things you've got planned for the next two years okay cool so is that something that people need to help out with or well actually <laughs> right now there's a meeting um i think it's probably just about finished as we're recording this uh online where they're kind of discussing how to get the reapproval application together okay um, but yeah it's being discussed on the uk uh, mailing list and uh, if you've done anything within the uk as part of the loco team then by all means jump on the mailing list and let us know and um we'll put some links to where you can um, gather this information and i see we get a reference as does og camp yeah because it's created by members of the loco team so you know it's a Yay. useful yeah. resource that's Absolutely. og camp <laughs> <laughs> oh mark's woken up right and that's all in the uh, bit about ubuntu this time <laughs> And it's time for your feedback. Mike Burrows emailed in to say... Following up on the request from your Spanish speaker listening in Series 4, Episode 9, Brave New World, if you don't have the opportunity to edit, e.g. if it's a live show, probably the biggest win you can get in control over dynamic range is in maintaining fixed distances between the sound source and the microphones. If everyone is prepared to use headset mics, then the fixed distance from mouth to mic will keep the level settings correct, even if people blithely elect to move their heads while you're recording. Yeah. <laughs> Love the show, volume discontinuities and all. See you all at Og Camp. Well, thank you, Mike, and look forward to seeing you at Og Camp too. We did actually consider um, sort of Britney-style headsets. I think mm -hmm. w when Dave was on the show in particular, he had a, <laughs> <laughs> he had a habit of, of wandering off mic quite a lot, didn't he? I think we all do it um, to varying I mean, what degrees. What are talking about, Alan? <laughs> yeah, very funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we do, and uh, we're going to be trying harder. I spent some time yesterday twiddling with all the settings and things. Hopefully this one will sound a bit better, and we'll try our best. To make Plus, sure we're not doing this one live. So. <laughs> and, of course, Tony has actually fixed us all in position against our mic so that we cannot move <laughs> to be honest I, I fail to see how you could be off mic in this setup but yeah the uh, the, the neck braces help don't they yes jonathan nadu emailed in response to last show segment about accessibility first i would like to thank you for covering accessibility in linux i'm a blind linux user myself and this is an important topic to go over but i would like to make some comments on what alan bell was saying about the latest release of ubuntu he made it sound like there were a few problems, but other than that, everything else seemed to work, which is not the case. 
The Orca screen reader does not work with Unity at all. You cannot get uh, to where the network manager is located in order to connect to a wireless network. Also, even once you connect to the network with cited help, Firefox doesn't work with the Orca screen reader and you are unable to surf the web. The only thing that can be done by the Unity desktop is to open up LibreOffice and create a Word document. Accessibility matters and shouldn't be taken lightly. I wish that Ubuntu would have put more thought into Unity before switching and breaking all accessibility in GNOME. Thanks for the podcast and keep up the great work. Thanks for the feedback. I know uh, Jonathan does do um, uh, a lot of work in uh, selling systems that have um, accessibility-enabled Linux distros. So he he is a bit of an expert in this area. So this is, I mean, obviously really good feedback for the Unity team to think about how they continue to make that desktop Mm. environment particularly accessible. And also, of course, I mean, okay, we can say, well, okay, at the moment the answer is, fortunately, you can fall back to the... the, uh, uh, the uh, the older style desktop, but mm. going forward, we kind of seriously need to focus on that to make this uh, as broadly as acceptable by people as possible. Okay. Yeah, Do, I've got a question. Then, does it matter that it's so badly broken in this release? Because we call these development releases. No, we don't. No, we we, we don't. People say, "Oh, it's just a development release," but there's never any. You know, when we release it, Canonical don't say this is a development release. By the way, they and say this is a new release of Ubuntu. I, I've been at um, at UDS when. Employ- canonical employees have called these cowboy releases right. the one the one after lts is always a cowboy release meaning that you know it's a bit rough around the edges it might be a bit broken yeah. and that was stamped on pretty much straight away by his management which was no we don't do cowboy releases we don't do development releases development releases are alpha beta before we do the final release but th- that okay. said it, it is the case that stuff isn't fully polished in non LTS releases and LTSs tend to be more polished. Okay, let me let me rephrase that then. Perhaps does it matter as much that this because this isn't an LTS release that there's stuff in it that doesn't yet work, presuming that the, there is then a commitment to make it work in future well, releases. Well, there was a bug filed about something accessibility related. I can't remember which specific aspect it was, but I know Mark Shuttleworth left a comment on the bug that said basically yes we didn't have time in this cycle because it was very aggressive to get unity done for 10 uh, 1104. Right. Um, you know, we've kind of dropped ball on that. So we're going to have to try harder in the next release. And we have two, well, one more release and then 1204 is, is LTS. So if it's not great in 1110, then it really should be good by 1204 because that's LTS. Yeah. And hopefully um, Jonathan and uh, the people he work with are, are filing bugs on these things and, well, as as I said last time, Alan and I and a few others, we we did a, a cooperative um, run through of the Ubuntu install, just yeah. the installer, um, with the screen turned off to see what it was like and oh, see yeah. if it was possible to do an install. And it it it's pretty horrible, you know. It was it, just with- it, it's not really possible for one person who has you know limited or no sight to do an install so yeah there there is some stuff that's pretty badly broken in in this release and you're coming to it with some familiar familiarity with the installation process yeah exactly i've seen, seen it before you know the screen yeah. reader is there exactly yeah for example well yeah yeah but even with the screen turned off you know you move the mouse around and the labels on things are just completely incomprehensible garbage because yeah. it's designed to look pretty it's not designed yeah. to be accessibility enabled unfortunately so yeah we need to do better on that it's designed to look pretty Yes. Okay, that's the main design point. Exactly. Well, <laughs> okay, that is a design consideration, yeah. Fair enough. And finally, Rich Wareham sent an email for the attention of the Wing Commander. It was ironic that the WC was berating you for not being au fait with classical languages, since the entire Latin segue was started by him saying how aneric was a word of Latin root. Of course, you and I all know that it is from the Greek word aneiros, meaning dream. Interesting, there is a Latin word. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for giving me this one. Uh, there is a Latin word, onerusus, from onus or owner, which means burdensome or burden. The root of our word, onerous. Perhaps the WC is suggesting that anaric ocelot will be a burden on his system. We can only wait for feedback from them. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm amused and bemused that uh, the uh, Ubuntu UK podcast has become, you know, the, the way for the WC to interact with his, uh, his fans. Yeah. <laughs> it's vice versa. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much indeed for all of your feedback, but that about wraps it up for this time. <laughs>
That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. We've reached the magic 600 mark on Facebook now, by the way. And Um, also uh, one and a half million downloads. Yes, we've reached one and a half million downloads since we started. That's amazing. Which is about 20,000 per episode or something like that. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, Let us know what you think of the show or 1.5 million downloads of it, uh, or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Join us on Tuesday the 19th of July for our next live episode. So any remains to say thank you to Andy for coming and being our guest presenter. Yes, thank episode. you very much. Have thank you had you. a good time? I do. I always have a good time here, Tony, so thank you for inviting me again. I think both times you've had a good time. <laughs> that is true, yes. That's good. Um, and yeah, and so we'll be back for a, with another live show on Tuesday the 19th, back to the live episodes, and uh, we hope you join us then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.